yeah, it takes a couple of minutes and you know, there's all these event handlers firing different places and it figures itself out. So um, most of the event handlers were Bash, um, some were Ruby, um, depending on what I needed to do. So, but they run on the actual machines. Uh, Zookeeper was a lot simpler. Uh, Zookeeper was, it's just one set of machines. The, um, the zoo, uh, you just need to have all the host names in the configuration file. So when I spin up the environment, I have an extra settings option in my stack, and I say, you need to have three machines, um, and only when all three machines are up, try and start Zookeeper and form a cluster. So, same thing, event handle fires. Um, if the expected server count is reached, just exit. Once the server count's there, um, I actually execute Puppet from the server event handler. My Puppet runs are short enough that I can get away from it. They're like 20 seconds, 10, 20 seconds. Um, and all that does is just rewrite my configuration file. Um, I could use bash, you know, I could just use set to just modify the configuration file, but I, I kept it simple and just let Puppet deal with it. So, um, Okay, health checks. For every role, you effectively want to have a health check to go and say what application needs to run on there and is it in a good state. Um, the preferred method that I've opted for is just some script on a server that can interrogate locally and return a result, good, bad. Uh, if necessary, you could put a basic HTTP wrapper on the machines, get it with a HTTP call, execute the script, return, good, bad. Pretty common. Right now, I just S I SSH in the machines, and I maintain an SSH connection during the provisioning process, and I um, and I make it say, okay, go and check the state of a. Uh, I think it just runs the, the health check script on each server, and it either comes back a zero exit code or not zero. So once I get a zero exit code, I'm happy, and there's just acceptable timeouts on all of the roles, um, which are cool. So I briefly mentioned AWS caveats. So AVI limits. It's very, very easy to hit the request per second limits. Uh, the one I used to hit the most was run instances. If I try to spit up 40 machines in five seconds, they don't allow me. So you have to do exponential back off. Wait two seconds, then go again. Wait four seconds, try again. Wait eight seconds, try again. Um, the, the good thing is, because I'm using Surf, once the cluster is formed, I don't need to interrogate Amazon's APIs very much because the cluster knows the environment knows most of what it needs to know about other machines via surf, rather than asking the Amazon API every single time. Uh, one of the things that I only recently hit was Amazon has an EC2 metadata service that you can use on 169.254, 169.254. I actually did request limits on that. Um, and I didn't realize they had request limits on that until I hit it, because I was trying to work out why I couldn't I couldn't hit something on Amazon because I couldn't get the IAM role multiple times out of the EC2 metadata. So, so I realized I had to start caching it locally. Um, took a bit of troubleshooting to figure it out, but yeah, be very aware. If, if you're using Amazon, request on this. They, yeah, they can be quite painful. What I said before about environment names. Um, so I tried to start out with no environment names, uh, hard coded anywhere. And, and try and make it where you start an environment, you just give it a hope, you just give it a name and away it goes. The, um, the problem with that is you have a lot of third party applications that they don't they expect environments to, to live longer than I want them to. So I ended up having to to have a prepare phase. So the idea of the prepare phase was I would run it before I'd run it a couple of times beforehand and provide a handful of environment names. And then from there, those environments could be created at any time afterwards and destroyed at any time. But then anything that was prepared in advance would, would be maintained. Now, there was a decision around um, around what um, what I would prepare and what would go into the environment creation afterwards. The main criteria would be um, third-party modifications, time to propagate. So if you make a change with a third party and they take half an hour to propagate, I can spin up the environment in 10 minutes. I don't want to have to wait half an hour for the environment creation and I could wait for their propagation. So I do the preparation step in advance. Um, and the other one is maintaining that state with any kind of third party. So two big examples are Facebook apps. If you integrate with Facebook, there's no cost to have these apps configured in their interface. Um, and Facebook can take a few minutes to provision them. CloudFront distributions were more of a time-based one. So if you're using 
If you're not using custom SSL with dedicated IPs, it's 15 minutes. If you're using custom SSL with dedicated IPs, it's about half an hour. Uh, and I use a CloudFront distribution per environment to give me the option to make modifications to it on a per environment basis if I want it. Um, but there's no charge to have those environments there if no requests are being made to them. So I just prepare them all in advance. And I just say, okay, I've got 10 dev environments. In the end, we opted to use fruit as the environment names. So I just said, pick 10 fruit, and I'll prepare them. Um, there, there was about 10 different third-party integrations I had to work with. That's just two of them. Um, the Apple example I gave at the start was one that I still couldn't put in the preparation phase. If they had APIs that would let me do it, it would, I would do the preparation for those. Um, but, yeah, that was too painful. Um, would it be possible that if you had some more, like ELBs you mentioned before, that they suffer around? Yeah. So, what I could... Like the idea that Technically, you... yeah. So, I could... So, what, no, what I do right now is so the preparation phase, yeah. I have no DNS names. Yeah. So, the DNS names I can use in the preparation phase to go and tell for the party, this is going to be the URL, yeah. but the DNS group doesn't actually exist. But then what I do is when I create a environment, the DNS record comes up and it just starts working. Now, one of the interesting caveats is when you create a Facebook app and you try and put payments on for test payments, you're required to verify a callback before they will let you save the details. The environment has to exist with your code on it to be able to test the callback. So that I actually had to create the environment, test it, to the test callback, and then destroy the environment just to get past Facebook's caveat. Um, so yeah, um, this is my third last slide. Um, lessons learned. So yeah, when you need to maintain state, um, store it off the server instances if you can. Uh, try and use S3 or some kind of external storage. Um, obviously, you don't need to maintain state on every machine. Um, let's say you need logs, try and ship them off somewhere and use some kind of centralized logging. If you have some kind of database, if you have it on, you know, if it's something like MongoDB, for example, it's probably just use EBS. Uh, if, yeah, if there's little things that you don't need to store locally, store them somewhere off the machine. So, um, it, it's cheaper than keeping the machine online 24 hours a day. So, uh, yeah, cool, that goes through that. Uh, now, one thing about EBS, I don't, even though when you're spinning up EBS-backed instances, uh, where the disk can be maintained and you can stop and start them, I still treat the root volume as ephemeral. So I don't store anything I care about on the root volume. I have an extra EBS volumes um, section within my stack configuration, and I give the volume a name, and I even can go and say what rate level, and it'll go and say yeah, as many rate volumes as are required, and <coughs> automatically format them on star if they haven't already been formatted. Now, uh, the secondary volumes, they're mounted into like slash MNT, slash EBS underscore something. If I destroy the environment and recreate the environment, it will, first go and decide, based on tags, are there EBS volumes that already exist with the right tags on it? If so, just attach the old volumes to the new machines. Otherwise, create new volumes and tag them and, and assign. Uh, so that means you can maintain persistence even after destruction. I then have another phase, which I haven't gone into, called purge, where you destroy the environment, you can also purge the EBS volumes, and you just go through a new block volumes. So, um, Future plans, uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, consider using Docker for the role-based AMIs. Um, replace static quantities of each role with auto-scaling groups. That's probably one of the bigger items I'd like to do. Um, whether or not I, and, and yeah, going to the next one, auto-healing. So even if I don't auto-scale, I would at least like to auto-heal. So even if I set min max desired as the same value, three for example, I want to know that if one of those three goes away, another one's going to come back and it's going to automatically try and bring itself back into whatever cluster. Um, so, yeah, uh, some of these event handlers I've got would need to go and say, okay, a new machine's come along, put enough logic there to figure out what state it's in, is it other existing nodes, or do I start a new cluster? So, just start with circle, you look at the worst. I know where scales are. So, I did a. I did a. Um, <laughs> Elaborate on the question. I just like, for example, you know, 
autoscaling group and that's so, another chair on that. So yeah, correct. Auto, so autoscaling groups were something I opted to leave until later on books. I thought I'll go with static numbers of machines first and then I'll move into autoscaling. And all it would really involve is rather than specifying a quantity in my stack config, specify min max design and then um, and then from there, rather than spawning EC2 instances, spawn, spawn auto scaling groups, which will spawn instances underneath. As long as you have the data associated That's with the right. server, then it yeah. will serve to discover all the traffic. That's right. So, surf here, obviously, at the end of the day, each machine will come along and surf will just start, and then the event handles will just need to decide what happens once that machine comes online. How does it bring itself into whatever application scope it needs to bring itself into? Um, before I started using Surf, I did a big spreadsheet of all the different service discovery options I had and the pros and cons. And one of the big ones was central coordinator, central coordinator, central coordinator. And yeah, I limited most of them. Um, and yeah, memory footprint, CPU footprint, things like that were big factors. It runs anywhere Google. It runs on Android. Nathan, um, just because we've gone on a little bit of time, yeah, of course. Uh, there's probably some people who want to stay and have yeah, questions. If no anyone, yeah, just don't feel embarrassed if you've got to go or whatever, so we'll probably keep going. I, I'm, I'm ready for questions if anyone has questions or, yeah. What volume? Can we go to the volume as much? Right now, logging, I am not handling, uh, but my intention is probably going to be ask this log, uh, pumping it off somewhere. I haven't decided where I want to do it. Probably, probably spin up log stash instances or something like that. Um, I haven't given it serious thought. Monitoring, I want to try and do at a at a higher level, as in uh, execute the health checks on the machines to decide if the machine's in a good state, rather than running. Effectively, I'd be replacing an RPE by doing that. I may even opt to put an RPE and just do checks, but. Um, I haven't used NRPE enough to know whether I want to, um, whether I want to go down that road. Um, I do, definitely don't want to have to do a lot of plug-in things So, yeah. Are you considered looking at console, which is basically the surf on scale? So console came out after surf was released, and I started using surf <laughs> um, before console was released. So, I, it's an option I considered, but I was far enough down the track that I didn't Providing yet, so I I just kept going down the surf track. It probably wouldn't be that bad to to put it in because if anything, really, it's um console is just a superset of surf. Well, it's surf plus. Yeah, I mean it's got some things in there about um, health checks and stuff that right. can automatically remove things. Yeah, I think that would be one of the reasons I'd consider it rather than you know going rolling my own you know, health check framework or something. Yeah. And the other aspect that's really interesting is it provides a DNS uh, access to the information that it has. Yeah. So if you find a service, it actually has service records okay. uh, that you can use to configure instead of you know, configure actual files. Yeah. And that's yeah. ACOs. <laughs> one of the things you started with, which is the cost, you know, like when you know, was that, was that perceived cost or was it the business like is this costing us too much money you've got to change the way you're um, doing no, like, was it, it was the actual cost of sorry no, it's more specific was it the actual cost of amazon or was it more like oh this is weird we're just we're just running the static cost machine. aspect wasn't a if you were running all these machines all the time it would be it, I worked, it, it's not far off parity if you're running all on demand instances the big benefits was paying by the hour and only having to with all of our other previous environments, we had to pay for the whole month regardless. So one of the big things that we were looking at from a cost perspective was we could only pay for it when we were using it, and when we destroyed it, we weren't paying for it. And that means if we needed two environments one week and zero the next week, we were paying for two that week and zero this week, rather than paying for two the whole month. So from a cost perspective, it, was, uh, it wasn't really the highest priority. It, was, it wasn't an item that I saw that would be long-term beneficial. But it wasn't, it wasn't a push there because it would be a, you know, oh, it'll always be cheaper in Amazon. It, it wasn't really. I guess I mean like overall cost in terms of like this complexity in what you've yeah. built, yeah. right? And so the management of that complexity in your time versus, you know, like there's like staffing cost and complexity cost versus like the overall cost of... Uh, knowing the cost of our production environment and knowing my current salary, <laughs> I know... Um, 
probably versus you working on something else, for example, like you know, opportunity costs or something. Three months about my salary, which collaborate. Uh, yeah. No, no, actually no. I, no, I take that back. Um, yeah, three months of our environment cost will be my salary. So, yeah, it's a decent size of uh, it. Yeah, it. Um, the, I think one of the bigger benefits was not uh, was the fact that we could spin as many or as little as well. Yes, it wasn't. So that was why I obviously didn't want to be restricted by environment names initially. I wanted to be able to. Spin, if I wanted to spin up a hundred on, I wanted to give a hundred different names. I wanted to be able to, you know, know I could do. That. So, um, yeah, before it was the number of them was dictated by how many we provisioned, you know, we spent our time provisioning. So, um, yeah, it, it wasn't really, I guess, a direct consideration. Um, at the time when we first started the project, there was a internal push to look at doing a bit of a private cloud type arrangement. Um, and one of the concerns I had was the stack being used internally was didn't have a lot of API support and it was being managed out of our head office in San Francisco and getting support from them would have been time zone dependent and so I first started provision a few machines and then realised why can't I do this, why can't I do that and I was going to them almost on a daily basis for about a week trying to fix problems and we always had it in our mind okay we had these expensive environments with Rackspace we were going to go try to do this private cloud thing internally to try and drop some server costs, um, you know, consolidate a few things. And then we had this long term goal of our CTO at the time, which was Amazon, you know, was probably the place you want to be longer term because it, it provides a lot of flexibility you wouldn't have elsewhere. So um, in the end, after messing around with our internal private cloud offering, I, I spoke internally um, with my manager and we said, let's just skip and go straight to Amazon. Um, and Amazon was only a new thing within our organisation about two months before that. Um, we had a new CTO uh, and he came along and said, let's go, um, you know, let's move as many of our business units over to Amazon, compared to what we're paying with software and rack space. Over time we're gonna see we're gonna see benefits. So yeah. It sounds like this has been used for So I've been having to manage three public code bases <coughs> throughout this time. Now I'm trying to cut the cord on, on the old ones. Uh, the good thing is I'm now at a point where all development environments are mi migrated. Uh, our, we've done load testing environments. Uh, we've hit a few bottlenecks, but they're, you know, we can work around them. Uh, we do a lot of use of graphite and things for metrics. So part of these environments I have to spin up graphite instances and point everything at them. So um, the, uh, we also have load generation machines. So as of today, all of our load generation has been moved off our old vendor and into Amazon. So the good thing is we run a load test. We only spin up the load generation pass when we need it, tear it down when we don't. Uh, there's, there, there, there's cost benefits there. Um, the load test environments are the same thing. They're almost the same cost as production. So you know, we need to represent production. Um, we haven't decommissioned our non-Amazon load testing environment just yet, um, but I'm hoping to at some point, um, pending getting signed off from all of our server guys. So, uh, production is one of the next items, but I have a decent sized backlog before I'm willing to go there. I want to get auto healing for starters at a minimum, even if I don't have auto scaling, I want to know I can auto heal. Um, I need to work on monitoring, I probably want to get centralized logging there before I do it, and I want to get... Um, I need to work out back data backup stores, things like that. Uh, so yeah, I've got a decent backlog before we move production. Uh, we're, we're actually just discussing how we want to attack this now internally. Uh, we started with the other stuff. Uh, just today though, I noticed the benefits to just the dev environments being Amazon. Uh, before, we had four dev environments, a test environment, a stage environment, production, and load test. The four dev environments, one of them was our uh, our like product designers, just almost all the time. The other three were feature testing environments. We were rationing those regu like regularly. We were using all we had to queue up for them. Uh, just today, we had eight development environments in use. Um, and one of our 
team, one of the, the team leads, generally managers, you know, who's working what features, merging code branches, and you know, he kind of shepherds a lot of that stuff. Um, and now he pretty much spins up the environments and destroys them as features require them himself. Um, so, um, yeah, that's out of my hands, and yeah, that's completely yeah, handed off now, which works really well. What, what ends up for the applications to go onto the Deployments? So, deployments are uh, right now, I've opted to keep the deployment process relatively the same as our preamble with the intention of changing that once we have parity. Uh, so for now, it's SCP, tables, extract them, groups of files around stops and services, and stuff and services. It is all programmatically done. It's a separate Ruby code base that does it. Uh, and I just provide, right now, I actually have to provide host names to it. But I want to change that shortly and make that Ruby code base interrogate, get all the host names and then do it. That would be too difficult. We just haven't done it yet. Um, the, the next thing I want to look at doing is baking the code into the role-based AMIs. So when we do, we build a new role-based AMI whenever we have a new code revision. We take the bootstrap AMI, we do all the stuff on it for that role, and then we bake the code into it and we spit out resulting AMIs. And it's the file provisioning in the packer with the table? Yeah, yeah, things. so that's right, yeah. And I would either do something like on the machine in a file provisioner, I would either W get the artifact off something or on the machine and then extract it, or I would feed it in as a file provisioner. One thing I found with Packer, if you provide a lot of file provisions to a lot of things, it actually hangs if you have any kind of network loops. Um, and I've had a bug in on Packer GitHub for about four or five months trying to get the problem. So, um, yeah, I may move more to pull rather than push to alleviate that. Um, but, yeah, at the end of the day, supply the other stuff with just those, none of the IP and the Key to get into the new machine. Is that how it works? Is it you're managing? Are you talking, are you talking about <laughs> the names after the? Oh, so right now the uh, the environment creation scripts obviously set up DNS names and everything. Um, in terms of SSH keys, we have them all in Puppet. Um, one of the things I'm not happy with is because they're versioned, keys are not changed when people update them in our self-service portal within our organisation. Um, and I'm trying to get that changed by moving more to an LDAP SSH. Model. So the module only runs once and then SSH is authenticated against some kind of central LDAP elsewhere. Um, yeah, that, that, that's an unsolved issue. I even brought that up in the, um, in the open spaces that um, uh, DevOps needs to try and get to the bottom of that, and there wasn't a perfect solution. So, yeah. Um, At least they're fresh and we will dispose of them pre pre A good example of today where this process helped me. Uh, was anyone familiar with the bash vulnerability that went around today? <laughs> yeah. So all I did was click the build new bootstrap image. And part of that is apt get dist upgrade. That's all I had to do. And then I have new AMIs at the end of it in 20 minutes. And any time someone spits up an environment off that, you've got, you've got an updated bash. I could have obviously relied on a bunch of unattended updates as well. I think I still have those enabled, but I logged into a few machines and they haven't updated themselves yet. I thought, yeah, I can't just be new images. <coughs> uh, I, I don't, I don't disupgrade when I spin up each role. I only do it when I build the image right now, just so that it's predictable. If, if the image works, it should always work. So, yeah. How often do you rebuild, rebuild uh -huh. environments? Uh, environment? <coughs> uh, environment rebuild. Daily, multiple times a day. Like today, I think I got about eight or ten emails from our environment manager, Ben Bridger, which would include creates, destroys, Things like that. So does that use self-servicing their own environments? Uh, yeah, they can self-service them out of Bamboo. Anyone within within our team that has Bamboo access uh, to start builds can also start um, can also start environments themselves and pause them. What do you do if you find an environment that's been left there for a few months? So right now I, I've been just tracking myself by hand. The next step is going to be look at the metadata, see what environments are out there, maybe on a once or twice a week basis. Um, I, wait, I want to try and get some of our developers to throw an API method at our API to say last user login to our, our main application. And then I'll make it where for each environment I hit that API and if there's no be no logins in 24 hours, I store the creator in that S3 metadata, send an email to the creator and go, do you still leave this environment? If not, can you go turn it under? Give, just give them some nag emails. So that, that's probably going to be my first approach. Um, and then. Right now, uh, the good thing is there's only a couple of people that have been actively creating them, and 
and they've been pretty good. Um, as soon as I tell them there's a cost associated, uh, they usually are pretty good about not leaving it behind, and they know that I track who. So, yeah, I haven't had to go and, you know, yeah, harass people yet. So. Is there room for taking stuff out of the initial image? Like, do you use the import to set, like, um, like, is this for size? Some people say the Debian's can make it a lot smaller. We opted, to, the main reason we is we, we use Ubuntu company wide. Um, we've opted to do that mainly so we have the option to go economical for support. We kernel bugs, things like that. Um, that was a company decision. I personally run Debian at home. I wouldn't have a problem with it, but I was comfortable enough to just stick to that internally. So yeah, as a company decision. So Ubuntu was light enough that I was okay with just sticking to that road. And the good thing is Ubuntu provides source AMIs that I can use. Can I ask, for your employer, what's the commercial drive for all this effort to be cloud agnostic? Um, so, my, the current structure of my employer, uh, I work for an online game developer. Um, so we, we do like free to play, like freemium type games. So you, you jump in, you play it, you can pay after, you know, pay for, they're, they're mainly like MMO type online games. So, um, one of the biggest motivators would be um, consistency, I guess, because everything is programmatic, there's no risks of, um, oh, this environment doesn't look like this environment. There was always issues with that type of thing. There was always a disconnect of, oh, you've done this on production, or you have, I, I have as little as possible if production, else if stage, else if this type of stuff within any of my public logic. I try and keep it as, as close to the same as possible across all of them. Um, in terms of, um, so I work uh, for a team that's focused on one of our games. We've got four or five games within our company. Most of the other studios are based in our San Francisco office. Um, the team here uh, was quite interested in autonomy because of the, the time zone differences and um, they were, their preference was to yeah, operate as autonomous as possible locally. Uh, and being I report locally to this studio, um, they wanted to try and, where possible, over a period of time, um, cut the tether from the central operations organisation. So um, that was mainly one of the reasons being um, visibility. The, the central operations team operated in a different source control systems. Now that the local studio here had any visibility. So you ended up with that there, the knobs brick wall. I, I, as a DevOps engineer, report locally to the studio um, and I work out the same source control systems as all of the other developers in the studio. So there's no there's no boundaries of you know who can see what's where, who can change what's where. It's all it's all maintained out of the same system. So um, the reason for doing it the way we did it versus just say spinning up static environments, um, the flexibility aspect of saying we need ten environments this week and we need two next week, um, and making sure they're consistent every time. Do you deploy it anywhere but AWS? Not right now. Yeah, so do you test that? Like, you know, like, you know, like, was, I think a couple of your slides you were like, you know, um, there was a stated goal of being agnostic, but then you're using, like, if you're not testing your fog crawls, fog's, fog's a great example of an extraction where, you know, like, if you don't test it in different environments, they don't work. Like, you know, like, a certain call, like, you, you stick to, like, a very basic set of, like, create, destroy, yeah. I use I use a handful of things. Yeah, I use create, destroy. Um, I there's a few other calls like you know servers all things like that to like get a list of all servers. Um, I think I use like some of the uh, I use I use uh, for route fifty three. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I do that. I do create all my zones, create all my records in there. I have hit bugs in Fork that I've had to get fixed. Uh, with you know you couldn't return NS records in. Um, you couldn't return NS records uh, for subdelegations in parent zones as part of it, so there was a bug in there, and I had to work around that. Folks pretty good at doing so. It's they are pretty good. Yeah, I've um, because I've done pull requests, they've obviously put me on the contributor list. So now I just get, I think I might have even subscribed to it or whatever as well. So I I get pretty much every form email. I usually just keep track of them. All. Um, same with Packer. Um, so I haven't had too, hit too many weird issues, which is good. 
Um, one of the next things I would like to do is we used to use a, um, we had a vagrant uh, development environment that we used for local development on VirtualBox. Uh, that was one of the three code, part of the code bases I'm maintaining right now. Now that I've got a relatively generic code base that I started with, I would like to, um, I'd probably like to go back and build VirtualBox images um, with Packer at the same time as we build images um, for AWS so that people can reuse Vagrant. The problem was the previous Vagrant approach, I started with a vanilla OS and then ran Puppet to do everything. It would take 20 minutes to do Vagrant up. Whereas I could probably bake all of that into the, the VirtualBox, um, you know, the Vagrant box, and then, you know, it would take like a minute. And I would just make new ones as part of the Packer ones. Now that I have those tools in place, I'll probably do that. It's, it's been on my back wall for a little while too. I guess thinking into your question, it was more like, you know, like the amount of abstraction you've tried to do, but yet you're still tight. You know, like, like you kind of, you know, like you mentioned that like it's not as tight as you could have been. But to be honest, I probably just, I was given enough of a leash that I, I chose that direction and no one objected. It's right. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> do you think, do you think like in, from your employer's perspective over a longer period of time, say a couple of years, do you think if you committed to an e-cloud platform, whatever it is, if you got really good at it, would you be better off commercially from like cost-wise of maintaining this platform versus being really awesome at it? But, you know, committed and locked in and all that, oh, those, oh, those are bad words. Would you, would you be better off from a money standpoint though? So, yeah. Well, so I see, what I see talking to people is people are, you know, particularly software developers, and I am a software developer by background, we're very keen to, you know, use interfaces and abstract things and version control, all that kind of good stuff. And people tend to then, well, let's apply that to our cloud platform as well. And I wonder whether that's actually really a valid strategy, right? Is, is it not better to be really good at your platform, be really efficient at your platform, know all the knobs and the dials and the buttons, tune the heck out of it and save a lot of money versus try to stay sort of a step back, not use all the bells and whistles of any platform, but be able to go anywhere if you want to. Well, so, there when, might be benefits. I mean, this is the this is the effort of moving when you need to move yeah. versus the effort of upfront, you know, not using some of those features. I opted to to take the don't be too bound at, at mainly as a bit of an insurance policy in case I find some reason where our developers go and say EC2 instances are not up to the task of what we're doing. We're getting too much noise from noisy neighbors, something like that, like we decided we didn't want to use dedicated instances. Whatever caveat we came across, I didn't want to get, have a scenario where I go, where to now if I had to pick another provider. Um, it was obviously the first time I had dived into an Amazon deployment as well, um, but I was a little hesitant to lock myself in too much with things like RDS, cloud formation, um, you know, other tools like that. Um, I did obviously, anything I've locked myself into now is mostly available from other providers and it would be weeks, not months to change. Um, so I kind of made that as my design decision. I, I knew there would be work to change it, but I wouldn't have to start again. I would only have to change pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, um, but this is the age of abstraction question, right? Like, yeah. do, I, do I bother? Or do That's I bother, right. right. Like, it doesn't yeah. matter whether it's a platform or whether it's a library that you're abstracting, yeah. it's the same. Yeah. Like, it's easier to not abstract. Yeah. You know, and then abstract. So, and and later right. on, you might regret that or you might. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it was just a design decision I made at the time. Um, what would you say is the way to keep um, Amazon just a bit anxious that they <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. Just in case. I, look, I, I must admit, I've gone down this path when I first started using the cloud uh, platform and I've come around to basically, I'll worry about that if I need to worry about it, yeah. when I need to worry about it in the future because, the, the you know. It's changing, like it's like surf, right? You didn't yeah. know about console and you yeah. know, it didn't exist, right? That's it's right. Like, you know, like things are still rapidly changing. I think I'm almost comfortable enough now with Amazon that if I did another project, I'd probably, yeah, I'll just do some of the things, I'll change them if I need to. But at the time, I didn't know whether we were going to commit to Amazon as the provider of choice. Yeah. Um, other factor I was keeping in the back of my mind is our CTO was a um, ex-director of Google who um, ran most of Google App Engine. And he was obviously getting uh, 
comments from ex-colleagues of, when are you going to come use our platforms? So I was keeping it in the back of my mind of if we found some technical caveat, I, I probably wouldn't go down that road until I had a technical reason to need to, but if we found some technical caveat in Amazon that prevented us from using that for, for the future, then I didn't want to have to start here. So there, there was a time penalty in doing it, definitely. Um, there was a bit of reinventing the wheel, I think. But um, yeah, it is good knowing that I have that flexibility. Um, another example right now would be if I wanted to spin up load generation machines in Google Compute to point at Amazon environments. I can probably do that with minimal modifications to our stack. Um, and you know, if I wanted to have one side on one vendor and one side on another vendor, I could do that. Right now, I just spread it between two regions. I just put the generation in one region and the environment in another region, just to give it simulate, give you that latency simulation of a real user for an application. So we have a we have like a Java application that actually goes and simulates a user and performs the same actions as a user. Uh, we, we just run many of those. Each, each JVM run simulates about a thousand users, and we just run about you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 of those machines after one year. Yeah. I just realized that this is this question, this AWS agnostic question, is a question that doesn't get answered in the AWS Yeah. <laughs> because at the AWS meetup, it's all about using As we said, these room meetup. That's true. Yeah. 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 The vendor doesn't want you to move. Good question. I guess I probably asked like one of the better things we did was trying to not put layers in front of the Amazon APIs for what the stuff we've done. It's just kept things really simple to get things going. If it weren't for the fact that Fog did so much of the work for me, I probably wouldn't have gone to that much effort. Uh, and even with Packer, it's specified a few different parameters in the JSON file. Like yeah, the fact that there were tools that gave me that multi-cloud provider. Well, that's yeah, okay. Extraction getting richer and richer. Other things, less yeah. effort for you to do. But I, mean, yeah. I, I like your content, but once you test these things as well, there's only like we're the insurance that it's actually going to work. Yeah. But it's interesting that you've created a JSON cloud formation equivalent, right? So you could have probably used the cloud formation format and and read that. Yeah. That you know, I mean, these are just. I I've seen some really heinous cloud formation stuff. Yeah, like it's, uh, I've seen some of the stuff people trying to bed in <laughs> And yeah, you just think, does that really belong in that JSON file? <laughs> just does like cloud formation, I've never been very reasonable. Like, yeah, yeah you know, that's it. right. Well, you look like you can't put comments in JSON. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's another fun thing. What was that Python macro around cloud formation that you can't bed in the lazy side? Like, why is it using Python? It's much more readable. Well, it still generates the cloud formation. Yeah, well, I, I have a Ruby script that generates a package JSON file. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah. Um, I read in a stack of it and just throw the API files out of this. It's actually a tweet that you tweeted just in the last week about using um, um, JSON and big files that you should be using for the Yeah. The good thing is, it actually wouldn't be much work for me to do that. 